Well, thank you. It's great to be here in Baltimore, Johns Hopkins, and appreciate you attending today's session on tuberculosis in prisons and jails, a topic that is very near and dear to my heart as an infectious disease a physician and as a public health officer assigned by the Surgeon General uh, to the Federal Bureau of Prisons. And I think that alone is a recognition of the important role that correctional medicine plays to our nation's public health. Our objectives today are listed on the screen. We're going to briefly give you an overview of what's happening in corrections, both from a population standpoint and tuberculosis, look at recommended TB control measures for the correctional setting. We're going to also give a case review that will give you um, an overview of steps for doing a contact investigation within a correctional facility. And then what's hot in TB in corrections? What are the things that we're looking for for the future to improve our infection control efforts? I know a large part of our audience is the public health community, and I just want to start out with a very general comment that I think, you know, resources are limited in many jurisdictions, so where do you put your energy in public health? And I would like to argue that congregate settings are one of the areas we need to be concerned about, whether it's measles outbreaks in a college dorm whether it's an E. coli outbreak in a daycare center, norovirus on a cruise ship, congregate settings are where oftentimes infectious diseases emerge or reemerge. And they also are a strategic site for public health interventions. This is true historically, even with uh, probably the most dramatic infectious disease outbreak um, in the last century or two, and that is the 1918 pandemic flu. Um, which, where did it start in the United States? Where did we first see those signs of pandemic influenza in 1918? The military barracks in Fort Riley, Kansas. The San Quentin prison in California. So the, these are sites that have always been important for public health, and they remain so today. Most of you are familiar with MRSA, Community Associated MRSA, methicillin-resistant staph aureus infections, we now know about. The average non-medical person talks about MRSA. Where did we first see community-associated MRSA in the United States? It was in the state correctional facilities. There were large outbreaks there, well before it was recognized, even by academic medicine. The same is true for tuberculosis. It's a concern that we have because it's airborne. Congregate settings and historically, public health has been uh, very concerned about tuberculosis transmission within the correctional setting, which we'll talk about more in just a minute. I did want to highlight the dramatic increase of Americans who are incarcerated. Over the past two decades, I think this slide is just very dramatic to see what's happened since 1980 in the US. 2.3 million persons incarcerated in 2010. Almost every one of these 2.3 million individuals is returning to the community, back to their families, back to their children. So obviously a huge impact on public health. And these numbers really just reiterate the previous graphic slide. We would note in the state correctional facilities for the first time, the numbers are starting to decline in 2009 and 2010, but not at all dramatically. And we will still certainly um, have large numbers incarcerated for the foreseeable future. And a subset of these inmates have untreated mental illness and chronic addiction. And this is important for us, I think, in public health and in TB control because these are populations that often don't make it to the clinic in the community because of their mental illness, because of their addiction, and where do they show up to get their health care. Oftentimes it is within the local jail or the state prison. So an opportunity uh, for us again to intervene with this at-risk population. For those of you who aren't really that familiar with corrections, I always want to make the point that these populations are very eclectic and it becomes very important when you start to engage in what kind of public health interventions are most strategic. 
We talk about jails, what do we mean? We mean short-term facilities, pre-sentenced individuals, they're jails throughout the United States in almost every county. So almost everyone in our audience today across the nation does have a congregate population in their local community in the jail setting. We have state prisons. These are sentenced inmates who are put in state, convicted and placed in our state prisons throughout the United States. And it varies, but in some states, every county has a state prison. So these can be widespread as well. And then there's the federal prison system. We have both detainees, jailed inmates, and also sentenced inmates. I did want to mention briefly about private correctional facilities because increasingly, states and the federal system are privatizing correctional health care, or in some cases, the entire facility is privatized. Why is this important for local and state public health? Because these are your stakeholders. Your stakeholder may not be another government official. It may be the private sector, and they become important uh, stakeholders for you to communicate with and engage with. What about the Federal Bureau of Prisons? We have 132 facilities. We've grown enormously over the past two decades, largely because Congress continues to federalize crimes. Um, probably the most dramatic recent was the Adam Walsh Act uh, with, for sex offenders going to federal prison. We have over 10,000 sex offenders in our system since Ad Adam Walsh was enacted. That's just one example. We have nearly 200,000 inmates incarcerated, and what most people are totally unaware of is that 25 to 26 percent are foreign born, largely related to drug trafficking. We have some prisons where 99 percent of our inmates are from other countries. We have some prisons that over 100 countries are represented among our inmate population. But it's not just the Federal Bureau of Prisons facilities. Uh, that house federal inmates. Our U.S. Marshal Service is responsible for transporting inmates, detainees primarily, throughout the United States, and they contract with 1,800 correctional facilities, usually local jails. They're all over the United States in the communities represented by our audience today. And there's ICE, our Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Our colleagues there are responsible for managing 11 detention facilities that house criminal aliens, but they also have contracts with 240 additional correctional facilities throughout the United States. A dramatic increase in the number of individuals removed by ICE last year, you can see nearly 400,000. Some of these individuals from other countries were in the United States for a day, some of them for a year. Many of them interfaced uh, throughout all 50 states through our local jail system. As you're probably aware, overcrowding is a huge issue in the United States. And you can see in this slide, um, with the darker states having the most overcrowding, that almost every state correctional system has some overcrowding. The most dramatic being in California, and you're probably aware in May, the Supreme Court, in an unprecedented ruling, ordered the state of California to release 33,000 inmates because they felt the overcrowding was so severe that the health care may be unconstitutional. That was the first time that had ever happened, but it gives you a sense of how overcrowding um, is a major issue and a driver and certainly impacts TB control. This is not a federal facility, but it gives you an idea of a common dorm type setting where you have cots that are stacked one on uh, another. Um, I don't have a slide of it, but uh, one of the big concerns in corrections is what we call triple bunking. It's a small cell with ha which has actually, instead of just a bunk with two beds, it actually has three beds in a very small cell, a big concern in corrections in general. So I'm not going to talk a lot about TB pathogenesis, but just to make sure everyone's on the same basic playing field. In TB, individuals get exposed. Very difficult to predict if you will be infected from an exposure. 
on average 30 percent of family members to an index case, an active case, uh, become infected. But I know from my colleagues here in TB Control, I'm always surprised when we do our contact investigation as to who, who becomes infected and who doesn't. Sometimes the spouse uh, remains uninfected and, and the friend is infected. So um, it can be very difficult uh, to predict. Once infected, most individuals for a lifetime are able to wall off the TB bacillus, and although it's alive, it's dormant and does not cause disease. In 10%, it does cause active disease, with the highest risk being in the two years after infection for 5%, and then a 5% risk for the rest of your life. So what's happening in 2012 with TB? Well, well, certainly we are thrilled with the decline in TB cases, which peaked in the United States in the early 90s. And I would uh, just reflect that that also was the time period when we had large-scale outbreaks in state correctional facilities, probably the most dramatic MDR-TB outbreaks in the state of New York, where um, many inmates died and one correctional officer died in 1991. Since that time, we've done a great job uh, in TB control. I mean, it is a very controllable, contagious disease. That is the good news. I think we would say, though, that we can't rest on our laurels. There are still, uh, I think, a lot of reasons for us to be concerned. This is a slide that shows where the hot spots are in TB case rates. I don't think it's a big surprise uh, to this audience. Um, and I don't think this slide is a surprise, but 2001 was the year that we saw a flip of the majority of cases in the United States not being in US born individuals, but foreign born. And that has just um, accelerated um, over the last 10 years with more and more on a percentage basis of our TB cases in the United States being among our foreign born population. And why is that also of a concern? What's happening around the world with TB control? Do they have that nice? declining cases that we just showed for the United States? No, and in fact, we're very concerned about resistant tuberculosis. In some um, studies, 20% of isolates uh, worldwide multi-drug resistant TB, resistant to INH and rifampin, 2% res resistant uh, to more than just two drugs. And you may have seen uh, just recently in, in the news about uh, India reporting perhaps pan-resistant tuberculosis isolates in Mumbai. Uh, so um, again, this is a concern for us as we have more globalization, more immigration, uh, and uh, the, the concern about resistance in the United States from other countries uh, cannot be overstated. Uh, this is a slide that from the CDC that just shows that uh, the cases of TB uh, in corrections are eight times greater than the general population in the United States. And why is that? It's really not because we're having sustained outbreaks in the United States and prisons we're not. Um, it's because we have high-risk populations who become incarcerated, as I mentioned, often not on medications, whether they're homeless, whether they have AIDS and they're not taking their antiretroviral medication. Uh, the first time they're identified with active TB is upon incarceration. But we do have overcrowding. We do have poor ventilation in some facilities. And transmission certainly can occur uh, within the correctional environment. In the soon-to-be-released inmate document that was commissioned by Congress, um, in 1997 estimate in that report said 40% of TB cases in the United States individuals at some time passed through a correctional facility. So I, I mentioned most of these points. Uh, I think one of the, the interesting things we found in Maryland uh, and, and published in Clinical Infectious Diseases, and this was in the state of Maryland, that the longer individuals were incarcerated, the more likely they were to have a positive tuberculin skin test. And we were able to show that conversions occurred more commonly in those institutions within the Maryland State Correctional System that had the most overcrowding. We had a case of multi-drug resistant TB um, recently identified at intake at um, our, a California prison. And I, I show this slide because, again, multi-drug resistance identified in a Mexican coming into a federal prison. 
And just with that one case, we had 388 inmate contacts to a multi-drug resistant case. And in a very short period of time, through cars and airplanes, they were dispersed throughout. Uh, you can see on the, the red on the left, 102 deported, um, mostly back to Mexico, 38 released to California, 43 sent to one of our 116 prisons, uh, 43 facilities involved out of our 116, and 63 were in transit in local jails with the U.S. Marshal Service throughout the United States. So again, that's just one case of TB within a correctional system. When you have these highly dynamic mobile populations, it is a major concern for public health and against, again, an argument that the congregate setting is worth our investment as public health officials. This is a slide where I really wanted to emphasize something that you may not have thought about. We look at those blue states. That's where we want to put our energy, correct? Well, we do as public health officials because that's where a lot of the foreign-born uh, individuals are that have TB. But those of you listening to me who are in the white states on this slide, you're low incidence areas uh, for TB. But my point is you do have foreign-born detainees and inmates that are in your states. And oftentimes, the healthcare providers that are providing care both in the community and the hospital and within the jails and prisons have very limited TB experience. And that's really one of the things we're facing right now with TB. Is it possible in 2012 that you'll have a resident go through a premier university and never take care of a TB patient? Absolutely. Where are they cared for? Most of the TB patients are cared for in the community, and a lot of our, our residents aren't getting that kind of training. Is it possible for an infectious disease doctor or a pulmonologist to be consulted upon, particularly in one of these low incidence states, and never have treated TB? Absolutely. So that's just, I think, what I wanted to highlight here is just really the importance as TB wanes in our country and our expertise is not what it was perhaps 10, 20 years ago that we reach out to public health to make sure we're getting the right recommendations. Fortunately, we do have very good guidance um, with the CDC document from 2006. It's still very current on the prevention and control of TB in correctional and detention facilities. The Bureau of Prisons has its guidelines from, from 2010. They will be updated in 2012. I'll talk about that in closing. I don't want to review the guidance uh, from the CDC. It's really too much information for this venue. But you can see it really does cover everything in TB control from screening, isolation, um, diagnosis and treatment of both active disease and LTBI, discharge planning, and contact investigation. I will uh, note that the, the stepwise progression on how to do a contact investigation both in the MMWR CDC guidance and the Bureau of Prisons uh, was developed by Ms. Burr and is really a superb tool, particularly for frontline nurses who are doing contact investigations within the correctional facilities. The CDC guidance and so does the BOP emphasize the importance of an intake screening that looks for TB symptoms listed on this slide. And we're emphasizing more and more they must be language appropriate. As more and more cases are among foreign-born individuals who may not speak English, um, this becomes a critical issue that the communication of TB symptoms is accurate. The CDC does divide correctional facilities into minimal risk listed on the left of this slide, minimal risk for TB, Primarily looking at, do you have cases of TB coming into your jail or prison? Do you have an inmate population that's foreign born or that has other high risk factors for tuberculosis? And then the non-minimal TB risk facilities. For those that are at, at uh, minimal risk, uh, the symptom screening is adequate. For everybody else, which is the majority of our jails and prisons in the United States, we do um, the tuberculin skin test or the interferon gamma release assay, which I'll talk about later, or routine chest x-ray screening. Um, 
this slide really was a document that was produced by Ms. Burr and others and published, but I think it's important. They looked at TB screening, symptom screening, in a large urban jail and were able to show that oftentimes the screening was not done well or documented. And that's why I think it's, it's really imperative, again, for the audience uh, around the nation to really go to the local jail and to look and see what is occurring through the symptom screening process. This can be a very chaotic time for correctional officers. Um, I don't know if any of you here locally have, have been in uh, the detention facilities here in Baltimore, but at oftentimes you can have 10, 20, 30, 40 in our system in the BOP, even hundreds of individuals coming in, sometimes unexpectedly. And so doing an accurate symptom screening can be challenging, uh, but it doesn't take long, and it's extremely important for public health. What about doing routine chest x-ray screening in lieu or with tuberculin skin test screening? Um, this really depends on your population. They're very eclectic populations throughout jails and prisons. And uh, I guess one of my take home points, uh, particularly to our public health colleagues around the nation, is to really understand the population in your local jail or state facility. Because if you have a high risk population, if it's largely foreign born, you may want to do universal chest x-ray screening. We do do that in several of our facilities where we have the, the again, 99% of the population coming in being foreign born. Whether it's cost effective or not is really gonna depend on your rates of TB. The advantage, of course, is immediate isolation and the ability to segregate those contagious inmates from the rest of the general inmate population. Another one of our take home points is the collaboration that must occur between corrections and public health. And when we get our infection control officers all together from around the country, one of my questions to them in a plenary is, can you name your local public health colleague for TB control? for hepatitis, for HIV, that may be one individual, it may be three individuals, but have you met, personally met with that individual? And so my charge to those of you in public health is, do you know who that individual is in your local jail or in your state correctional facility? Because it really does begin with that trust that yes, public health is there not to come in maybe and to do an investigation and get the jail or prison into trouble, but is really there to support them in their efforts to control tuberculosis. Uh, and, and it has to be a bilateral commitment and trust that will only develop when there is that personal uh, collaboration. We're now gonna shift gears and Ms. Burr is gonna talk about a TB outbreak in one of our federal prisons. I've been with the BOP since 1996. Uh, we've only had one outbreak of tuberculosis in a, a federally, man a BOP managed facility, but we always wanna take lessons learned from that outbreak. And this is particularly instructive because it occurred among foreign born inmates in a low incidence state. 